Good morning, Temple family. This is Tom Douglas. I am a product of the ministry of Temple Church. I came to faith in Christ under the teachings and ministry of Jeff Hansen. Mike and Kay Douglas are my mom and dad, and I married into the Cutting family. Jeannie is my wife. Dave and Kitty are my in-laws, and I am so happy to be with you this morning. If you uh, could please do me a favor, I would appreciate it if you would pull out your Bible and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 12. We're going to look at one verse today, chapter 12, verse 1 of uh, Romans. And I want to talk to you today about what I think should be a core value for every Christian, no matter who they are. And that is that you and I, the title of my sermon is that core value. It's passionate spirituality, that it ought to be a part of every one of our lives as Christians. There should be a passion, a passion that's a core value. It is a representation of what is a part of our lives every single day. It should be immediately evident in your life and mine that we are passionate about our following of Jesus Christ, that, that he is a firm foundation that we stand on, and that, it's that he, it is he that lights us up every day. And as we get into talking about that this morning, I want to start by praying and asking for the Lord to guide us and guide me in our time this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask by your Holy Spirit that you would give us insight into your word, that you would use the meditations that I have um, to give this morning for your glory and not for mine or anyone else's. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. May your Holy Spirit give us insight into it. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start by saying I, I, what, what passion is not. Passion is not an emotion. It's not a feeling of any kind. Um, it is not temporary and not absolutely foundational for you to understand that passionate spirituality is not circumstantial. What I mean by that is that your and my passion and, and, and passionate uh, expression of our, of our walk with Christ is not based on the circumstances of the moment. It is beyond that that there is a foundation, a, a passion that is founded in something bigger than the moment's uh, happenstance or even the history of our lives that, that uh, maybe affects us or impacts us in negative ways or that we would even rest on our laurels of things that we've done in the past and we want to think back on those times and just sort of sit back and and think on them and just... And just that's enough mentality. It's that's not what I'm talking about today. And what I am talking about is that our our foundation, who we are, how we conduct ourselves every single day is based on our relationship with Christ. And it's based on what the word of God says and not any any one or anything or any moment. And because technology is amazing and because Rob Mullen is amazing, you're gonna have a key idea, this one thing that's gonna show up on the screen here really quickly. It's gonna be key idea and a colon and underneath it, you're gonna see the words passionately pursue God and it's coming up right now. See that, told you. You see, that's passionately pursuing God is what I think is jumping off the page uh, from the verse in Romans 12, 1. If, and I have hold no illusions. If, if you remember nothing else, there's one thing that I want you to hold on to, and that is that you and I should be passionately pursuing God. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Passionately pursue God. Have I said it enough times? Good. So open your Bibles. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. I will refer to the NASB, the New International, the NIV, uh, and um, I even am going to pull up some of the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, and even uh, the Amplified, if those of you who remember the Amplified Version. Uh, 
looking at several translations can really help us understand the impact. And what we're going to do is we're, we're going to walk through this one verse and, and see what Paul is saying here, you see, because Paul is, he, he's writing the greatest book of theology ever, and it's the book of Romans. And in chapter 12, the, it's a huge turn in the book. He, he's moving from uh, chapters 1 through 11 and establishing some things. And then on, in verse 1 of chapter 12, it starts this applicational of what does it look like for Christians to live out righteousness? What does it look like for you and for me to live the truth that Christ has has saved us, has resurrected us, has infused who he is into our lives? And that begins in, in chapter 12, and it runs all the way through chapter 15. And it's this, uh, what does it look like? What, what does the picture look like for Christians to live for Christ? And so he picks up, and that's why you, in, in your translation, even if it's not the new living, there's a transitional word like therefore or um, uh, in, in the in NLT. Well, let me read the whole verse for you out of the New Living Translation. Paul writes, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. The New Living Translation starts with, and so. Maybe yours, if it's NIV or NASB, uh, says, therefore. And it's important to ask the question, why the big transition word, therefore? And I, I, truly, I think Paul here is saying, now that I've made my case, now that I've been talking to you about all of these things in chapters 1 through 11, here are the implications of that. And, and uh, I'm going to finish our time this morning by focusing on a couple of what I call so what's. We're going to talk about what the truth of God's word says here in, in verse 1, but then we need to ask the question, so what? And, and Paul is basically tw in 12, 13, 14, 15, he's hitting it again and again, the so what's. So here's what it looks like. So as we see the therefore, and in the, in the New Living Translation, the and so, he's saying, based on everything that I've said to this point, here's the implications of that. And he's saying it, and, and so, dear brothers and sisters, do you think he cares about this congregation he's writing to in, in the city of Rome? Uh, one of the things that history has told us, it's a divided congregation. There's a large sec segment of um, Jewish population that has come to Christ. They are followers of Christ. They're struggling with what it means to live uh, both this New Testament, New Covenant life, yet having grown up with the Old Covenant and the law. And um, he, he's he's done a lot of work, Paul has, in talking about how we move from one to the other, and that's through Christ. And so he's writing to this congregation that's both Jewish, and then there's another segment of the a large segment of the congregation that is that is Gentile. And he's never met them, but yet he uses a very endearing or personal terms uh, to refer to them, dear brothers and sisters, dear family members, because of us both all of us following after Christ and having Christ change our lives, we have unity that is, uh, it's not something we have to strive for. It is given to us as a part of becoming a follower of Christ. You and I have this tremendous unity in Christ. And so he's writing, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, as if they're family members that he cares deeply for, even though he's never met them. Have you ever experienced that where you meet somebody, you find out they're a Christ follower, and immediately you have this connection and this foundation and, and um, a connectedness where it's like you've, you've known each other for longer than you have actually because you're part of God's family. And he's, he's saying to this audience that he is 
hoping to go and meet see he's hoping to move his base of operations to rome so that he can launch from there and 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 have another missionary uh journey that would travel out and spread the gospel and so he's he's writing to them and saying okay you need to know what it means to passionately pursue christ and so he says i plead with you now um nasb niv they say i i therefore i urge you uh i, I plead with you to give your bodies to god this pleading this urging this uh beseeching uh it's it's sort of uh halfway between a request and a command paul is saying because of everything that i've said in chapters 1 through 11 i've been writing a lot of these things therefore i can say to you uh, you now know all these things i plead with you to to follow what i'm about to say and it's not a suggestion and it's not a command it's somewhere in between uh it's like if you remember when you were younger and your mom came to you and said something like you need to do something about those dirty socks that are all over the bathroom floor and down the hallway and into the living room when she's saying you need to do something about those dirty socks you know it's not a suggestion and it's not an outright command but you know you'd better heed the words of mom and 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 paul in this sense is really just right there he's saying okay you need to pay attention to what i'm saying here because you know uh, you should and uh, so that's the the idea of he's pleading and, and and he says i want you to and the and new living translation says give your bodies to god now it's it's offer um, some translations use offer or present present and and it's really pulling from the old testament and and paul is really bringing us into uh remembrance if you're a jew but then also the gentiles need to to really hear this too and that is he's drawing the imagery of of temple worship and sacrifice uh you know offer present give your bodies to god is drawing to the to the mind, to mind, to the front of our brains. Hey, think in terms of like when you went to the temple. It's the place where you went to connect with God. It was where the manifestation of God's Shekinah glory is. It's where the every human being knew who was Jewish. This is where I go to connect with God. And when you go there, you as a worshiper never come empty handed. And when, when Paul is saying, the, you know, offer your bodies to God, when you come to God, you do not come empty handed. You came in the Old Testament, you came with a gift, a sacrifice, a, a lamb, a bull, uh, you know, a grain offering. Uh, maybe it was a, a, a dove of some kind. They were always to be perfect or first fruits. You brought your best. When you came into the presence of God, this is what you do. You know this is the place to connect with God. And so you don't come into it lightly. You don't come unprepared. You bring something to offer to God. In this case, what are we offering God based on what Paul is writing? He says, give your bodies to God. Give your bodies. So it's it's not just the thing you bring. It's you and I. It's you and me. This New Testament uh, imagery of moving from old, the old life, the old covenant, or the former, you might say, covenant into the new. It's no longer that you bring this thing with you. You bring you with you. And that is what you're offering. It, it is it is an, an offering. Um, the, the translation of the word offering in the Old Testament is literally a thing brought near. And it's the idea or the sense in which this thing I'm bringing, whether in the Old Testament it's the offering animal 
or first fruits of, of the grain. In our case, it's, it's me or it's you. We're offering this thing because it is bringing us near, near to God. It was the finest and the best, and you and I are integrally involved. It's uh, the whole sense in which um, we're making an offering. And uh, this offering, he says, because of all God has done for you. Let me back up. I plead with you to give your bodies to God. And the reason that you and I do it, the thing that has drawn us into his presence, the thing that drives us, if it probably more so it's better to understand it, that it is a, uh, it's a gravitational pull. When you and I trust Christ, when we, when we follow Christ, when the spirit begins to work in our lives, when we live out this righteousness that God has imputed, he's given it to us. He's pulled our old self out. We've, we've, we've died with, with him. And then we're raised to new life. And, and God puts in our hearts, this new man, this new woman, this new being of who we are, that thing that is new, newly made in us. We're just drawn, pulled by the spirit of God into his presence. And then Paul says, because of all he has done for you. Um, and in the NASB, I think it says, by the mercies of God. Um, and NIV, you know, in view of the mercies of God. Here, the NLT says, because of all he that God has done for you. In view of God's mercies. Paul is saying, now here's the time when you should think back and specifically Look at all that I've written in chapters 1 through 11. You know, in chapter 1, he begins right out of the gate. He talks about the absolute righteousness of God. The first part, like the first 17 verses of chapter 1, he's talking about all of the, the goodness and the purity and the uprightness and the holiness of God. And then in the second half, 18 and following chapter, 18, or chapter 1, verse 18 and following through chapter 3, there's the unrighteousness of you and me, the unrighteousness of, of humans. You know, the, the uh, Romans 3.23, we've all fallen short. And he's focusing on the fact that you've got this righteous God and you're, there's an unrighteous human beings that is true of everyone. Three through five, uh, chapters three through five, Paul starts talking about how the justification works, that there's righteousness that's imputed into you and I in, in chapters three through five. Um, you know, in five there where he talks about how it's so serious, this unrighteousness that there has to be a death and a, and a, and a leaving behind of the old ways and the old self and the, and the try harder of the new, uh, 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 excuse me, of the, uh, the, the law, you know, he, that then there has to be a raised to new life, a resurrection, a, a, a remaking of you and me. And in verses or chapters six through eight, he talks about the sanctification of, of you and me. He's talking about how the Holy Spirit moves into our lives and starts working on us. You know, the Holy Spirit that's called the paraclete, the advocate, the uh, one who comes alongside, who teaches us things that we couldn't possibly know, who prays for us in ways that we couldn't understand that we needed to pray for. Like, you know, Jesus says, hey, Satan is asked to sift you as wheat disciples. And I've interceded on your behalf. You had no clue any of that was happening in chapter eight. You know, it's Paul writes that the Holy spirit groans before the father on our behalf in words and in, in things in, in utterances too deep for words. And that whole idea that, that the spirit working in our lives to sanctify us, to, to continually work out our salvation as we relinquish more territory to God. And, and that, that uh, he then floods in as we turn over who we are to him. And 9 through 11, boy, Paul talks about how Israel has been rejected. That, that God says, okay, I'm going to reject, the, I'm going to harden their hearts. I'm going to set them aside so that I might work in other areas in Gentile lives. And that, that God has done this because he loves everyone, not just Jew and Gentile, but the entire world. 
And, and Paul is saying, because of all of these things, that's what he's referring to as God's mercies. Everything, the, the working out of the salvation plan, how God has worked in your life and mine. Based on that, that you and I, because of all he's done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Them in the NLT meaning our bodies. These, you and me, us, that we bring to the presence of God. Th this um, uh, sacrifice is now a living sacrifice. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind he will find acceptable. Living, it's ongoing, it's continuing. It's a, a thing, the tense of the verb they're living is um, one where it's, it's basically, it's a decisive moment in time that has happened in, your, in the life of a Christian that then impacts our lives from there forward. It, it, it has trajectory into your life and mine, and it lasts until either Christ comes back or you are called home to the Father through death. And, and that living, it's ongoing, continuing and lasting until our death. And it's not that momentary sacrifice that we saw in the Old Testament where, you know, it must have been a drudgery or here we go again, the Groundhog Day sort of thing that we have in the Old Testament where you have to bring another sacrifice yet again because I'm aware that I have fallen short. And so this living sacrifice is you it's an eternally living thing but it, it in this time in between of when we come to christ and when christ returns it's continual even though it's a decisive moment when we put our faith and trust in christ it has trajectory moving forward rather than the momentary sacrifice of the old testament and then he goes on and says it's holy it is holy it is set apart it is completely other it is um, just like the Old Testament, exactly like it. So if you brought a lamb for sacrifice, once the sacrifice is made, that lamb is good for nothing else. It's, it's not going to reproduce. It's, it's not going to uh, provide an income. It's not going to provide wool for, for maybe sale or anything like that. Once one brings the sacrifice to the temple and brings it to God, that sacrifice is good for nothing else but bringing glory to God and to bring you and I nearer to the Savior, to the Father, to the author of our salvation. And so the idea of holy, the set apart, it is no longer going to be a part of the profane, the stuff of this world. The, it, it is dedicated completely for God. And the fact, the idea of, or the wording there of it being acceptable, you know, um, New Living Translation says, uh, the, the kind of, the kind of sacrifice he will find acceptable. Um, it's, uh, pleasing to God. It's accomplishes the requirements of what God has for the sacrifices being brought to him. You and I, in Christ, when we offer and, and have offered our bodies completely, God use it uh, in, in every situation. That's acceptable to God. Unlike what we read in Malachi chapter 1, verses 7 and following. Turn in your Bible there, Malachi 1, where you see the lame and the sick and the worst uh, offerings of the flocks or whatever. It's the, the people of God are not bringing their best to God. And that is unacceptable. And Malachi the prophet relates God's opinion of those things. And so this complete self, all of you and me, we bring it to God and, and, and it, nothing held back. That's the idea. That's the, the significance of the fact that it's ex acceptable to God. And it finishes by saying, uh, this is truly the way to worship him. Now there's a, there's a difficult word there. Um, many translations say, this is your spiritual act of worship. 
it really doesn't do justice to the wording that's there that Paul uses. Um, this is the to, to think of the way we should think. What, what kind of worship is it? It's the truest. It's the most congruent with all that Paul is unpacking here. That the a, a, an equal sign uh, of all of the things that God has done for you and me, our response is to offer ourselves completely for his purposes. That, that you and I would um, be worshiping him in this act, in this conscious act that you and I make to, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. It's congruent to our position before God and our station in the kingdom that we are members of the family. And, and so the most, the thing that makes the most sense is for you and I to offer ourselves. And in this, um, the word worship there is not localized. Particularly this is, you can understand that this is true in the New Testament because now we don't go to the temple. Where is the temple now in the New Testament? It's in you and it's in me. And so wherever you go, your worship should be happening. It's not that we look for that that little shot in the arm every Sunday, even though clearly scripture says that's what we are supposed to do. But that it's every single moment of every single day. There is no secular, there is no out of worship service idea for the Christian. It's always on every context, everywhere. Boy, is that intimidating. Thank goodness we have a paraclete an an advocate someone that comes alongside of us to work out the image and the manifestation of Christ in us and it's not based on it's not based on feelings it's not based on emotions it's not circumstantial other than the fact of the circumstances of what truth scripture reveals and so now i want to just sort of land here in this moment of so what? Because if you and I, and I have a problem with a lot of Christians, we we know we almost know too much, but we do very little based on what we know. At least that's been my experience. Maybe you're the exception. But this so what idea, we've studied this scripture I've unpacked what this wording means in, in verse one. And by the way, next week, we're going to look at verse two of chapter 12 of Romans. But, and so if we know what it means that there, there's the therefore and that, that Paul is pleading and that he's asking us to give and offer, present our bodies as a, as a sacrifice because of all he's done for us living in holy sacrifice that is acceptable to God. And this is the way to truly worship him. So what if we don't do anything with this, if we don't act upon it or act from it or allow it to inform who we are as people of God, as children of God, as fellow believers, then what's the point? And so one of the takeaways of passionately pursuing God the so what number one, and this is not exhaustive, but the number one so what that I think is that you and I, we can impact and have an impact on our passion. We can impact our passion. And it's how we behave, how we connect things in our lives with the realities. Uh, Gordon McDonald, I want to list some things. He's, he talks about... Uh, in one of his writings, he lists seven deadly siphons, things that siphon off your walk with Christ. Um, and the first one he talks about is that you have words without action. And this is why I have so what, you know, I, words without actions are empty. I think there's a whole book that talks about that, that uh, book of James boy, you know, faith without works is dead. So the first siphon is words without actions. Second is busyness without purpose. 
boy, does that get us all. I mean, think about the number of times that we get wrapped up in doing things and thinking we're getting something accomplished when it's really we're just on a, on a merry-go-round. There is no informed purpose. It's just motion. So that's the second one, Busy, busyness without purpose. Then he says, calendars without Sabbath. And, and that's a full schedule without a regular interjection of time to slow down our bodies and focus our minds on the giver of the Sabbath. So calendars without Sabbath. And then he talks about relationships without mutual nourishment. The one-way relationship where you give and you give and you pour out and you pour out, but there's no receiving. And if you don't have relationships that, that pour into you, here's the so what. To impact your passion for Christ, find a believer who is willing and able to pour into you as much as you are able to pour into them. And so relationships without mutual nourishment. Then he talks about pastoral personality without self-examination. And if we believe the truth that the scripture says that we are all uh, part of the priesthood of God, then you and I have, we are all pastors. We are all those who are called to, to have a pastoral ministry in others' lives. So you have this pastoral personality without self-examination. Um, and one of the ways to self-examine is to have people around you that will tell you the truth no matter what that will tell you the truth no matter what, no matter what the implications or the, or the impact of them telling you the truth is, but they have to love you. They have to lovingly talk to you about the things that are evident to them in your life because it's easier for other people to smell our garbage than us for us to smell our own garbage. We get nose blind to that kind of stuff. So pastoral personality without self-examination, uh, the sixth one is um, natural giftedness without spiritual power. So that's like something that you and I are innately good at. Um, and we do all in the flesh and not allow the spirit to use that part of us. And uh, he finishes with the one that I, I think is probably the biggest ouch for the American church for many years. And that is we have an enormous theology without an adequate spirituality. We know a bunch of facts from the Bible. We've had Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, but that doesn't change who we are. We don't allow the work of the spirit because we can quench the spirit, this adequate spirituality, the working out of our salvation in a way that changes who we are. And, and I am the this is not me throwing stones very far because I live in a glass house. But we have this enormous theology. We know all of these facts, but we don't live it out. I tell you, as a pastor, it is so discouraging for me to discover an 80-year-old adolescent in the faith when they've been around the church for 70 years. 75, they profess Christ at five years old. Put whatever age is in there so that you, we can impact our passion by the decisions we make about how we apply the truth and how we uh, use our time and how we understand our relationships. They're all important. And, and if, in every context where we are worshiping, then we have to think in terms of that. So we can impact our, our passion. And secondly, there is no age limit, both young and old alike. We cannot overlook the young and we cannot sit back because we are old. It's, it's, think about Numbers 13 and Joshua and Caleb and the, the spies have gone out and they've, they've looked at the promised land and they come back and they give their report. What a pivotal moment in Israel's history. The entirety of Israel, all of the, these people who hear it, they're scared to death. But then you have Joshua and Caleb who say, God is in this, let's go. Joshua and Caleb, you have to understand, are 
long in the tooth. They are further down, well seasoned followers of God. And that's uh, the, the latter half. And now I'm going to move back to the not overlooking people just because they're young. Because you know that Jesus, of the 12 disciples, most of them were most likely teenagers. Uh, as a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor for over 20 years. And this is a, uh, a, a truth that I've talked about with so many people that what do we do with the fact that Jesus surrounded himself with a youth group and poured into them. And they were significant parts of the early ministry of the church. Now, not all of them were young. I mean, you know, there were some who paid the temple tax and that meant they were of a certain age. And so we know they weren't all teenagers, but certainly there are ample examples of young, very young, who are incredibly used by the, by the Lord. The, the, Mary, the mother of Jesus, teenager, unmarried. In that context of being unmarried, you were pretty young. Uh, and... We cannot allow those who are young to overlook them simply because they're young. And we can't overlook those who are old simply because they're old or think that we somehow can retire from our faith. In the context of today is today is today and we made the decision to make ourselves a living sacrifice, that means until we are in the grave, God has a work to do in our lives. And, and that is that is how to passionately pursue God until our last breath. And I think that's the message from the word of God today. And I hope that the spirit of God has used the words of his Romans 12, chapter 12, verse one, to speak to your heart, to excite you. There is a new chapter turning in your life every moment. What does God have ahead for you? How can you be a part of what he is at work doing? Because there is no age limit, there is no moment limit. God can use you today. How might he do that for you? That is what I want you to walk away from. This day, this word is that you must be passionately pursuing God. Amen.